In this video, we are going to continue tuning our graph search algorithm. Of course, if you remember from the last video where we were building paths, we do indeed build paths between arbitrary node paths, but these paths are not very efficient. In this video, we're going to explore different methods of tuning the algorithm to make it more efficient. At the moment, with the way our graph search is working, it is actually working like a breadth-first search. This is in opposition to a depth-first search, where we would search to the end of a node chain before beginning with an alternate chain. In the current implementation, if you remember from when we were running the project, we would begin at the start node and fan out evenly addressing another row of nodes only after everything at the current level has already been investigated. So that way we start, you can almost look at the starting node as the center and fan out evenly from that node until we reach the goal. And again, this is generally termed a breadth first search. So what we want to do in this video is advance from a simple breadth first search and employ some new elements to make the search more efficient. The first of these that we will address is cost. We'll count the cost between the current node and the next node in order to better decide which node to explore first. In addition to this, we are also going to employ edge relaxation. What this will allow us to do is, once we find a more efficient path to a specific node, we can repair that node to reflect the more efficient path. And finally, we will employ sorting in order to help us make the decision of what node to pick first. So with this in mind, let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we want to implement is the cost necessary to travel to any specific node. So over here in our A star step class, we're going to move down to the continue method, which you can see here, and we're going to scroll down to the neighbor consideration loop. Right after we check the neighbor's close value, before we decide whether or not we're going to add it to the open list, let's put together a calculation that will tell us the cost to walk to this neighbor node. We're going to make a floating uh, variable, and we're going to call this variable neighbor g score. So neighbor g score. And neighbor g score is going to be the value of the current score that the current node contains plus the distance between the current node and the neighbor node. So that would be expressed here as current dot g score plus the distance between current and neighbor. To get this distance, we will use the static method held in vector two, that is the distance method. Into distance, we will feed the current node's position and the neighbor node's position. So looking back over, now we have the neighbor g-score being calculated from wherever our current position is. If we're looking at this as having been run from the first iteration, current is of course going to be the starting node with a g-score of zero. Then as we're looking at the neighbors, we check the distance between the starting node and all the neighboring nodes to figure out how far away they are. Then we record that final distance back into neighbor g-score. Now that we have calculated the score, we need to make sure that we remember it and update the state of the individual neighbor nodes. So we'll jump into our if statement where we were deciding to add the nodes to the open list and set their parent. In addition to setting the parent, we will also set the g-score. So we will take the neighbor node, set its g-score to be equal to the neighbor g-score value. Now, in addition to setting the g-score, because we are tuning all of this to work in the A star style, of course, we're naming everything based on the factors used in the calculation. We're going to be using f-score whenever we select a new node from the open list. So rather than write a sorting system that takes g-score into account and changing it later, we're going to write everything to be looking at f-score. So at the moment, we can still use only the g-score as long as we make sure it gets copied over to f-score. As a matter of fact, we're going to go ahead and put the calculation for f-score in place and simply rely on the fact that we are not yet using h-score. So that means we will take our neighbor f-score. We will calculate the f-score as being the neighbor's g-score plus the neighbor's h-score. 
And once again, since we know h score is going to remain zero, since we are never setting it, this is simply going to result in the value in g score getting copied over to f score. All right, now that we have our score system in place, let's take a look at these numbers updating. We haven't done anything to the path, and we haven't used the g score anywhere, so our behavior is going to be the same. I just want to show the numbers being employed as we walk through the node graph. So again, if we take a node, another node, hit P to begin searching, now we see a bunch of numbers light up. We can see G-score getting set for each of these nodes around the edges, and then that value, of course, being represented by the F-score. So now as we walk node to node, when new nodes light up, we have new distances. So if we look at this node that's listing as 160, we can see that the cost to get this to this node is 160 because we walk 80 units to get to the first and 80 more to get to the second. You can also see that diagonals are more expensive, of course, since we have to walk further to get to them. In this case, roughly 113 units instead of 80. Now, if we let this finish off to the end, find the last node, of course, we haven't employed that yet, so we're still using an inefficient path. But now that we are calculating the cost of our nodes, we can employ a technique that is known as edge relaxation. What we're going to do is we're going to check this new G-score, and we will compare the neighboring node, whether or not it's on the open list, or even if it is already on the open list. And if we find that our neighboring G-score is less than the G-score already held in the neighbor, then we will update the neighbor's G-score. So in code, what that means is we do a check. Obviously, if the node's not on the open list, it gets added and calculated. Now, if it's not on the open list, but we're looking at it from a more efficient path, we want to update it. So we will put an else if statement in place. And we'll say else if neighbor g score is less than neighbor dot g score. If that's the case, then we can update the cost and reparent the node. So for the parenting, we'll take neighbor and change its parent to be equal to current and we will take the scores and recalculate them. We'll change the g-score, so neighbor.g-score will be equal to the neighbor g-score variable. Then we need to recalculate the f-score. And to do that, I'm simply going to steal this line above where we were first setting our f-score. So again, this is a case that will happen only to nodes that are already in the open list, but are being in investigated from a different direction because if we don't get into this if statement that means it was already on the open list so that means the node has already been considered and already has a g score but this if statement is checking and seeing if the current g score that's possible to reach is less than the g score already recorded then we'll update the parent and we'll make sure that we change the path to be the new and more efficient path so with this now let's build and rerun our test of getting between these two nodes so hit P, begin walking through various nodes, and we'll watch, watching closely for when this fir node first gets parented. You can see that the moment that we reach this corner node here, of course we, we uh, examine all of its neighbors, one of its neighbors happens to be the goal node, and therefore the goal node gets parented. This is originally why we had the odd shaped path. Then, of course, we continue looking at various nodes, but play, pay close attention to what happens to this node the moment we inspect this node closer to the goal. Matter of fact, that's the next thing that happens. We explore this node. We notice that the goal node is one of its neighbors, and also that the g-score from this node to the, to the goal is less than the original g-score that was calculated for it. So we saw the parenting indicator update and the score drop. So now we will continue exploring various nodes until we reach the goal, but this time the parenting hierarchy goes through a much more um, optimum path. So you can see that using edge relaxation has greatly helped our path efficiency. So moving on, the next topic we want to address is sorting. In sorting, what we're going to do is make a better decision about what node to pick next because right now we're simply picking the first one that happens to be open, which means we're going to end up exploring most, if not all, of the open nodes on our way to the goal, even though there may be shorter paths to take. So what we need to do 
is we're going to select nodes by first sorting the list. So I'm going to scroll up a little bit and point out that it is here at the near the top of Continuum where we're going to be grabbing open list sub zero. If we were to first sort open list based on some ascending criteria, then zero should be the shortest of whatever we calculate, depending on how our sort routine works. Now, in order to make a sort routine, of course, we can't use the standard built-in sort because that sort has no concept of what f-score is and if objects may have it. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a comparison routine and then store a link to that in a comparison delegate that can be passed to a list's search function. So let's scroll all the way up to the top right before the begin method. And we'll put together a method that can be used to compare nodes. We'll make a static integer method that is called compare by f score, or rather compare nodes by f score. So compare nodes by f score. Then this comparison is going to need to take in two nodes. So we'll have a node called x and a node called y. Now the purpose of this comparison is to simply say which should come first, x or y. We will return 1 to indicate that x should come after, um, after y, and negative 1 if it should come before, and 0 if there should be no change. So basically we're just assigning a priority to these to these nodes. So we'll begin with an if statement, and we'll say if x dot f score is greater than y dot f score, then we will return a value of 1. So saying that the value in x is greater than y. And we'll do an additional check to say if x dot f score is less than y dot f score, then we will return negative 1. Now, if neither of these statements were true, if x was not greater and y was not greater, then we will simply return 0, indicating that the node's cost are equivalent. So this function can now be used by the sorting routine to sort all of the nodes in a list. Before we pass this over to the sort function, however, I do want to create a delegate to it by hand first. And the reason we'll do this is so that it does not get created on the fly every single time the list is sorted. So we're going to make a static comparison field. This comparison is, of course, typed. So we're going to make a comparison of type node. And this comparison is going to be called F score comparison. So F score comparison. Then we'll turn around and immediately initialize this to a new instance of comparison. And we'll pass in the reference to our actual method, which is compare nodes by F score. All right. So with our comparison in place, now we're ready to begin sorting. So down here in continue, right before we grab the first node in the open list, let's sort the open list. So we'll take open list, and we'll execute a sort. We'll sort using the second overload where we can pass in a comparison, and that is going to be the f-score comparison. So now we can build. We can see that there are no build errors. So let's run and test the result. So taking these same two nodes, we'll hit P to begin seeking between them. Now you can see instead of starting off to the side and up, the first node we actually pick is out to the right. Because out of the eight possible choices, four of these are less expensive, these ones that are directly vertical or horizontal. So we move one closer to the goal node itself. Now in the subsequent um, executions, we can see that we are going to explore all of the other nodes that have a lower score, ones that have 80. Now a few nodes have 160, so or rather a few more still have 113. And finally 160. Now we should have exhausted all but one node that has a cost of 160, 
leaving only the goal node. So the interesting thing we can see here is we did not explore all the way out to the edges of our example grid because in every case we were choosing the least expensive node to go and explore. So while we very quickly got to the node with a value of 80, it took a little bit longer to the one of 160 since a lot of surrounding nodes had a cost that was less. Now the interesting thing to point out about this behavior is we have reached an algorithm that functions the same way as Dijkstra's algorithm does. So like, what's happening here is we're doing everything in a cost-based search. So as we search outwards, we're always taking the uh, shortest path and basically, if you think about it, since we don't know where the goal is, we're taking the shortest path to anywhere as we transverse the grid. And you can also see that we're still behaving in an outwards, um, searching outwards from each of our nodes. I know I'm going to be in the distance here, and I apologize for that, but I just wanted to point out the nice thing here, though, is we have the ability using a... Um uh, the shortest path tree has actually been implemented with every node that we've visited so far from every node back to our source node because you could pick any node and if you follow the parenting all the way back to the source it's going to be the shortest path exactly thanks to the uh, edge relaxation that's in place exactly. we've got the original parenting that was happening in our graph and with edge, edge relaxation adjusting things as we go we're keeping the uh, shortest path uh, tree up to date as we advance through the network so again, just pointing that out roughly where we stand as far as search algorithms go. So on our way to a star, we can see that we've advanced from a very simple breath first all the way up to an algorithm equivalent to Dijkstra's algorithm. So with that now, we have fully employed cost checking in the form of G-score. We have employed edge relaxation using that G-score. And we have begun sorting our nodes to make more intelligent decisions about the next node to explore. And we've seen that the paths that get generated are now very efficient. So with all of this in place, that's going to wrap up this video.